All right. Well, now, uh, as you're facing this new project, you're also facing a lot of decision-making. They all kind of go hand in hand. And one thing that I often feel I have to coach um, engineers on is that, uh, in particular, um, you have one set of groups often thinking of this as, you know, in very broad, broad strokes. And then you have the engineering decision-making, which is generally a lot more particular. Uh, engineers are going to have to live with a product a long time, and um, so they want to make the right decisions so that they're not um, late or working all day and night and every weekend. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's almost like two different decision criteria need to be brought together. Um, you know, in business, you have a big, uh, I'm going to use this abbreviation a lot, this uh, ROI focus, the sense for return on investment. Um, you have people who are very deadline-oriented. They've made some kind of stra strategic or sales-driven um, implementation. If you're an ongoing, uh, you know, if your company, there were a lot of people saying they weren't doing this for the first time. Um, in that case, you might already be in a very globally focused company. So you have worldwide sales forces. So if your product is in, say, you know, is not internationalized, a lot of time there's going to be this str strategically driven deadlines that says, hey, we already have this worldwide sales force. We just bought this other company. They have this product. We better internationalize it so we can leverage it worldwide as fast as possible. Um, those are the decisions going on here. Uh, an important thing to to, to remember for a lot of people is that late is very expensive. Um, give you an example with round numbers. Um, if uh, there's been a strategic initiative to globalize a product, there might already, say, for 2009, be a, a sales number expectation that that product sells a million dollars worth of product in, say, uh, I don't know, I'll make something up, say a million dollars worth of product in Japan next year or maybe they just call it rest of the world or something like that. But if that product needs to sell a million dollars worth of, of, of expectation, um, three months late, if that product, let's say, gets released in March of 2009, ready for the Japanese market, well, there's a three-month loss in that, and that that is going to have an impact on the numbers, the projections for the company. So three months is conceivably $250,000 or one quarter of what the sales expectations were for ramp up for that product for the year, um, it it it's actually quite a bit more expensive uh, in real life when you're late than the example I gave you. That's a very conservative example, but you can see how making a mistake that impacts time is just rather painful from an organizational expectation standpoint. Um, now, the other problem is, is that uh, this is changing as people are getting a lot more mature in terms of the realization of, of development. But a lot of times the thought is, isn't this just a translation problem? And people have to learn. Now, uh, again, in terms of the engineers, they want the product to work. They're juggling requirements. They're thinking maintainability. And they have a lot of investment in the science of the effort, you know, how it works, how this is going to help. Can they trust this? Can, you know, that sort of thing. Um, at Lingoport, we really advocate a jumpstart analysis. Um, in this case, that's very different than a full drawn out assessment. That's quite a bit different than what we see elsewhere in our industry. We think we're right. We have a lot of history on that. Um, the jumpstart analysis is where we go, we build our requirements in an architectural overview. Uh, somebody like Carrie from our organization flies out, spends a little time with uh, your senior developers as well as somebody like a product manager to hone in on what are the requirements, uh, uh, both from a marketing perspective and from a source code tree architectural perspective. Now, that helps you look at not only what's in your code, but where does your code need to go, so what's not in your code. Now, the other thing we do, which is fairly unique, is we have a product called Globalizer. It's used very intensively to analyze code. It finds everything from embedded strings to, uh, let's say, locale, potentially unsafe locale limiting methods, functions, um, classes, depending upon your programming language, that will inhibit, say, the, the proper rendering of a character or a date or something like that. 
Um, from that, we synthesized the results from both the architectural overview into a project plan. And that project plan has a very complete list of costs for internationalization. The other thing, and this is pretty cool, even before we've localized, because we're analyzing our, the code with Globalizer, we get a really strong list of strings that, that are embedded in the application. So guess what? You can figure uh, the cost for localization even before you've internationalized, and you're actually ready to present return on investment. So very quickly, I have some examples here. Um, to just drag into the screen here. Um, this is an example project plan. It's for a product we did oh, way back in 04, but the same holds true. So this is the level of project plan that we do uh, after a jumpstart effort. It's, it's pretty darn complete. You'll see that there's all kinds of um, uh, uh, analysis on different parts of this application. There's uh, the Java section. There's uh, different application components. I kind of genericize the names here so, so you know, I keep the client confidential. Um, there's the server side. There's, uh, you know, putting together certain tag library frameworks. Uh, JavaScript needs its own special handling. We have a really good article written by Carrie, by the way, who's on the phone on JavaScript internationalization on our website under the resources section. Um, the um, uh, other thing you'll see down here further is there's always a database tier. These are things in common, uh, you know, uh, bug fixing stage and the like. Um, as people um, have questions, they want to talk about project planning, I'm happy to answer that afterwards. Um, another example is, you know, when I show, like, output of a globalizer report. This has been exported to Excel. You know, you can see a summary of lots of stuff that we found. This is actually a real report done on real customer code just recently. Uh, you can see we have all these strings and the detail here. Uh, you know, there's actually quite a few of them in the different parts of the application. But uh, this is pretty cool. Nothing's, you know, everything is still embedded, yet we know exactly what it is. And by the way, you can use Globalizer when everybody's all ready to suck those strings out and automate a lot of that process. But this lets us estimate really quite well. We also get to see little things like this. See how this is like programmatically adding a plural to days? In, in the, obviously, programmatic logic like that is not going to work in internationalization, where many languages may not have the concept of a plural. So um, this is pretty powerful stuff. Um, but when it comes down to it, uh, I'm going to I kind of talk through this. Um, so I'm going to squeeze by these slides. This is what Globalizer looks like when we find um, strings. This is the Globalizer interface. That's a string report, I think. It, you can click on something. It takes you to the, the, the uh, code. Uh, as it is, you can see I've externalized a few strings. We're probably the only product with a toilet plunger in our interface. We get lots of kicks out of that. But that's for sucking strings out. Um, that's a project plan. But then it comes to getting approval. So once you have your product plan, now you have some interesting stuff. In general, I'll let Eric take some industry benchmarks. So Eric, if you would take us through this, these next couple of slides. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as Adam had discussed, we've got kind of a working framework for what we're looking for um, tactically, operationally, to get the uh, application ready to go in international markets. Now, there's always the matter of you know making a case with the powers that be about getting this done. Um, some recent survey data um, from one of our industry's analysts uh, combined 20 largest IT firms, invested a total of $1.5 billion to garner more than $50 billion in international sales. So that's a ridiculously large number, sort of in keeping with the idea that, okay, everybody's looking at this and all the detail on the level of, of, um, of application and perhaps the allocation of resources in the front end going, oh, my God, this is a huge initial investment. But, you know, when you're returning like this, um, that isn't really that big of an investment at all when you stop and think about it. So, again, the same analysts recommended that we want to, you know, multinational enterprises, uh, a.k.a. your company, regardless of size on a scalable level, would probably want to look at allocating anywhere from 1% to 3% of international sales for reinvestment in uh, internationalization and localization.